Last time I had a look at the steel making industry for this channel, which was about 18 months ago, I discovered that it was responsible for about 7% of total global human induced carbon dioxide emissions. That video looked at the substitution of green hydrogen into the iron ore reduction process in an attempt to do away with the very carbon intensive coke that was used in blast furnaces. The hope was that by moving over to this new process, steel makers could reduce their carbon dioxide emissions by more than 90%. Despite the best efforts of a truly pioneering Swedish company called Hybrid, to date, there are no full scale industrial steel making plants yet employing the green hydrogen steel making process. And in fact, according to the International Renewable Energy Agency or IRENA, CO2 emissions from steel making have moved from about 7% of the global total to more like 8%, not least of which as a result of China's industrial recovery from COVID. The lack of adoption of the hybrid process reflects the fact that the electrolysis required to produce green hydrogen is currently several times more expensive than the existing method of making hydrogen, which is the process called steam methane reforming, or SMR, which releases oodles of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So although we will certainly get to a full scale green hydrogen steel making process in the fullness of time, we most likely won't get there soon, probably not for a couple of decades in fact. That means we need to find a slightly more doable quick fix if we want to really make a dent on steel making emissions in the short term. And now a group of researchers at the University of Birmingham here in the UK has provided us with a blueprint of how that might just be achieved. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Steel making is one of those so-called hard to decarbonize industries that some commentators suggest we should simply not worry about for the moment and instead we should be throwing all our available resources at the really big emitters like energy, heat and transport. It's a bit of a cop out though isn't it? And it's certainly not the view taken by most operators in the steel industry itself, most of whom seem to be quite keen to find solutions that could genuinely decarbonize their production. According to the authors of this new research paper, 71% of all steel produced today is made using blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces. Once the basic iron ore has been dug out of the ground, it has to be reduced into metallic iron. That's where the blast furnace comes in. Coking coal is added to the iron ore and limestone and blasted with air at temperatures of about 1000 degrees Celsius via jets in the base. Oxygen in the air burns the coke at temperatures around 1600 degrees Celsius, which reduces the iron ore to iron oxide and then to molten iron, known as hot metal. The limestone reacts with other impurities in the ore to produce a liquid slag that can be skimmed off. The byproducts of the process are carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. For every tonne of molten iron produced in a blast furnace, about 1.2 tonnes of carbon dioxide are emitted. The resultant molten iron, or pig iron, has a carbon content of about 4%, which makes it very brittle. So it gets transferred into a basic oxygen furnace, or BOF, where a very precisely controlled amount of air is injected in at extremely high pressure. That causes yet more oxygen to react with some of the unwanted carbon in the iron to produce steel with a carbon content of between 1 and 1.5%. One and the resultant emissions from the overall production process work out at 1.9 tonnes of carbon dioxide for every tonne of steel produced. The team at the University of Birmingham recognised the fact that we're some way off solving the global steel making emissions problem with green hydrogen. An awful lot of machinery and infrastructure will need to be converted at great expense to move over to the new method. And according to IRENA, the world would need a globally agreed carbon price of about $67 per tonne to make the hydrogen process competitive with the traditional blast furnace basic oxygen furnace combination. So the question the Birmingham team posed was, are we doing everything we can to make the existing process as low carbon as possible? And given that I'm talking about their findings on this channel, it probably won't surprise you to learn that their answer was emphatically no. The insight that the Birmingham team made was to add a perovskite material into the mix to minimise carbon dioxide production, which we know is the main greenhouse gas driving the warming of our atmosphere, and to maximise carbon monoxide production, which is not a greenhouse gas at all. You may be more familiar with the term perovskite in the context of the extremely encouraging role they appear to be playing in the development of solar photovoltaic cells, 
which is a subject we've looked at in a previous video. In this context, the science pods have used a perovskite material that has this formula, which they thankfully abbreviated to BCNF1. Now I'm going to read the next section of text as convincingly as I possibly can to make you think that I might actually know what I'm talking about. But don't be deceived, dear friends. I'm about as conversant with the intricacies of perovskites as you probably are. But anyway, just for fun, here goes. BCNF1 is a double perovskite material with a cubic structure where barium atoms are found at the A site of the perovskite, calcium, niobium and iron share the B sites, and oxygen atoms are found at the interstices. Apparently, when this BCNF1 perovskite is heated to 700 degrees Celsius, it gives up oxygen from its crystalline structure, which creates an oxygen vacancy in that structure. At 800 degrees Celsius, any carbon dioxide that happens to be nearby gets split into carbon monoxide with the extra oxygen atom being used to fill the oxygen vacancy, returning the perovskite back to its original form. Chucking BCNF1 into the furnace has been found to convert more than 10% of the carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide over the course of five cycles, which when scaled up to industrial levels is calculated to produce carbon monoxide at a cost of 19 pence per kilogram at an electricity price of 11 pence per kilowatt hour. Or if you could get your electricity price down to 5 pence per kilowatt hour, which at the time of publishing the paper was the average price for industry in the United States, then you'd be producing carbon monoxide for just 11 pence per kilogram. The research paper provides us with this rather complicated and confusing diagram to explain how a closed loop BCNF1 thermochemical cycle would work with inputs of heating carbon dioxide and outputs of carbon monoxide and oxygen. There are two thermochemical reactors down here. The first one is at 700 degrees Celsius to release the oxygen from the perovskite. And the second one reacts that reduced perovskite with carbon dioxide at 800 degrees Celsius to produce carbon monoxide. Once those two reactions are complete, the gas flow can be reversed to start the reaction off all over again, but in the opposite direction. The carbon monoxide produced in this way can replace 90% of the coke in the blast furnace, with the remaining 10% coming from biomass-based charcoal or even recycled plastics to provide a source of carbon. Now, there's an awful lot more science outlined in the paper that explains things like mass flows, heat fluctuations, and the number of moles of each component to fully explain every single step in this diagram. Much of that is well beyond the scope of this video, but if you really want to dive into the minutiae, then I've linked the paper in the description section below, and it's open access too, so it won't cost you anything to go and have a look. The Birmingham team calculated that overall, this technique which they describe as the TCBFBOF system, would reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 94% compared to a typical blast furnace basic oxygen furnace setup, with the only emissions coming from the biomass-based charcoal right at the start of the process. The obvious practical advantage is that you can continue to use existing blast furnaces and basic oxygen furnaces, which means the steel industry wouldn't be faced with a bunch of expensive stranded assets. It also means the preservation of highly skilled jobs and possibly even the creation of new jobs in the industry as part of the management and operation of the thermochemical reactors. Plus you get an immediate reduction in emissions as soon as the new kit is bolted on rather than waiting years for brand new technologies to come into reality. Right, bit of a wrinkle. As you know, this channel's Patreon supporters get early access to all these videos before you good folks out there in YouTube land get to see them. It acts as a bit of a filter to weed out any errors or inaccuracies in my research, which means you hopefully get content that is as accurate and realistic as possible. One of those patron supporters just happens to have specific responsibility for developing green steel decarbonisation pathways for one of the world's largest metallurgical plant suppliers. And well, let's just say he had a bit of feedback to offer. No names, no pack drill, but here goes. Apparently, replacing all the coke in the blast furnace with any gas is not quite so easy in real-world production as the authors of this paper have suggested. Coke has far more permeability for the reducing gases, and the physical crush strength of the coke itself, as well as its high melting point, help to stabilise the various materials in the mix and maintain movement towards the bottom where the hot metal can then be collected. The mixture of iron ore, coke and slag-forming fluxes is something the industry refers to as burden. 
Without the right mix and ratio of materials in the burden, the incoming gases could flood the furnace and stall the downflow of molten iron and slag, potentially costing huge sums of money to rectify. Then there's the perovskite. Usually catalyst absorbers like this are very sensitive to gas qualities, which means they can become poisoned by the gases they absorb, making the normal practice of recovering iron and steel making gases for a variety of other industrial applications quite hazardous. To get round that problem, a very intense process known as gas cleaning would be needed in real world full scale production to keep the perovskite working effectively. And that of course is yet another very costly additional step. Now the authors of this paper do say that research is still required to investigate the effect of coke removal on structural stability, but they don't appear to have factored that into their headline claim of a near 90% reduction in industry CO2 emissions. That doesn't mean their research is completely wrong, but it probably means a great deal more work will be required before this approach becomes a commercial reality. Oh, and just a note about SSAB and hybrid. I should say that they're not alone in their drive towards the green hydrogen solution I mentioned at the start of the video. Another firm called H2GS is in the process of constructing the first commercial scale hydrogen direct iron reduction plant capable of producing 2.1 million tonnes of reduced iron per year and completely electrifying steel making, casting, rolling and processing of steel. That plant's due to be in service by the end of 2025 and there are a number of other similar projects across Europe, for example, Gravity in the south of France and Blaster in Norway. So there we are then, folks. You live and learn, hey? You may even have other information that you can contribute to this particular topic. So I'll brace myself and head down to the comments section below to see what else I can discover. An extra special thank you then to the Patreon supporter who provided me with such important feedback. And a big thank you to all of you folks too for watching this video all the way to the end. I really do appreciate it. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.